Okay, ladies and gentlemen, and various other beings. So, this is closing out our SE Village speaking track. I've uh, got another funny story for you. <laughs> you may have, uh, oh yeah. We got a pineapple pizza lover here. We should stone him publicly. There should be, rant, we should, right? It's disgusting. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. It's not Italian. It's not Italian, okay? You're in my village. There's no such thing as pineapple pizza. No. I'm taking all that as support for me, okay? But that's not Perry. What we did is Perry, we, we, we invited him to give a speech here in the SC Village, and then we did a really stupid thing. On the schedules you have, we made his name Penny. Yeah, that's a big blunder when you print 5,000 of those things and then hand them out to everyone in the first two days. And then when the first uh, 2,000 are handed out, you look down and you're like, oh, crap. <laughs> so if all of you were coming here thinking you were going to see, what did you say, some socially awkward hot chick, right? <laughs> you didn't get that, okay? <laughs> what you got was my good friend Perry Carpenter. So if you would, help me in welcoming Perry to... Thank you, I appreciate it. All right, so I am not the cute, socially awkward girl you were hoping for. But um, this is going to be weird for me. So I'm the kind of guy, um, I actually do talk for a living. I'm the chief evangelist and strategy officer for Know Before. And I'm going to talk to you about um, something that I, I kind of revealed for the first time about uh, two or three years ago which was, um, you know, throughout my life, I've always just kind of feeled, or it felt a little bit strange and awkward, like, a, like an alien that's, that's looking at the world and the people around them and saying, what, you know, what makes these people tick? Why do they do the things that they do? Why do they act the way that they act? Why do they believe the things that they believe? And, and so on. And uh, about four years ago, I kind of realized after I read a book called The Journal of Best Practices that, um, and, and people have given me indication of this before, um, that I probably fall somewhere on the autism spectrum. And I went in and uh, got the diagnosis, and then I started to share that with childhood friends, and they're like, well, no, duh. We, we've known that for years, um, which made me feel great. But um, if you were to flash back at my life, um, kind of in high school, I was uh, hearing comments from friends, you know, really good friends actually, but things that um, were, were difficult to process a little bit. It's like, you know, Perry uh, has the emotional variability of a robot, you know, those, those kind of things. Um, and at that time, if you knew me, I spoke in monotone. I was very uh, rigid about the things that I said and the opinions that I held and all that. And uh, over the past 20 plus years, I've really been trying to go over and over and over again and figure out um, how I can improve myself and how I can fit in with society and those kind of things. And I, I am happily married. I've got two kids. I have a, a good job. I've kind of had an interesting evolutionary path to get through all that. And I'm going to try to trace through some of that today. And so the reason that I'm even talking about it at all, because it is hugely uncomfortable, um, is that uh, one day I made an offhanded comment in a presentation that I give all the time about deception. Um, so my life really has focused around deception and influence and things like that for, for a long time because I am so interested in humans and what makes us tick. So um, I, I was presenting this slide. It's a slide that I, I know Eric has stole from me before as well and presents, um, which is, I, I'll make the statement that uh, there, there are two things about human nature and humanity, two disturbing truths, is that uh, everyone is a master deceiver and we are all very easily deceived. And I made the statement about the, the mask and the fact that um, 
that throughout life I've put on and taken off various masks to fit in whatever role that I need to fit in at the time because of social awkwardness and of because of, uh, and I, I even mentioned Asperger's syndrome at the time. And that was a kind of a throwaway comment. I didn't even know why I said it, but it just felt relevant at the time. And then after I finished that speech, which was uh, obviously very well received, like all mine are, um, <laughs> I, I finished the speech, uh, ended it, and a stream of people came up to ask questions. And I thought it was the normal stream of people asking questions about deception and influence and social engineering and all that kind of stuff. But it was parents that had kids on the autism spectrum that were saying, thank you, you've actually shown me that my child can potentially have a future in society, contributing to society, making money, and all those kind of things. Um, and, and they were moved. And behind them were people that had been diagnosed and are on the spectrum and in, in their early 20s and starting their careers and saying, you know, thank you, you've kind of shown me that, that I might be able to learn how to open up over time and figure out how to, to fit in and do things like lead meetings and speak in front of people and, um, have a family and all those kind of things. And so it, it made me realize that maybe even though it's hugely uncomfortable, because I can talk about security all day long because I can dissociate that, um, maybe, it, maybe it makes sense every now and then to mention this aspect of my life. Um, and so that's, that's why I'm doing this. And I, I actually uh, published a book a few months ago on security awareness and, and driving secure behaviors. And in the introduction for that book, I, I mentioned my diagnosis and the way that I've looked at behavior and uh, all, all those kind of things. And it was one of those things that immediately when I sent it to my editor, I, I wish that I could take it back. Um, because I do believe, like a lot of people that have a diagnosis like this, um, there's a little bit of just awkwardness and, and almost shame that you feel whenever you talk about it because it is considered autism in a lot of ways, in a lot of forms, is considered a disability. And so it can be um, uncomfortable to mention that disability when you've been figuring out how to blend in your entire life. But at the position that I've found myself in now, when I actually do have the ability to go out and talk to hundreds or thousands of people at a time, maybe it does make sense to go ahead and be a little bit more open so that we can start to change the culture. And um, there's, there's good news. We're seeing that change um, as, as we see all these different diversity movements around the world right now, we are talk talking more and more about neurodiversity and being able to capture and leverage the different perspectives that people have, whether they're on the autism spectrum or whether they have ADHD or Tourette's or other things like that. And you're seeing in uh, organizations like GCHQ in the UK, they've got a neurodiversity initiative where they're looking for people specifically on the spectrum and with other interesting, unique ways of viewing the world. You see other large tech companies doing the same thing. And so there, there is a move to try to figure out how we can contribute to the world and, and do things in the most effective way possible. So let me just outline a little bit of my history. Um, because it, uh, it'll give you an idea of the journey that I've been on. Uh, first of all, this is, this is me. This is the standard slide that I usually use when I'm use, talking about no before. Um, my fascination for a long time, like I've said, is uh, related to psychology and human interaction and misdirection and all those things. And I'm going to talk about in a second uh, how all those fit together. But um, this is... You know, this is me. I started out in my career, really, I actually not knowing what I wanted to do. I went and got a degree in religious studies. I had another degree in philosophy. I had a minor in Hebrew. I thought I was going to go into linguistics. Um, I went to law school instead, decided I hated law school, so I ditched that. Went into computers for a while, got hired out of that. Ended up uh, being hired by Walmart and wrote the email system that was used in all the stores and clubs in the U.S. Uh, for about five years. Um, went on from there into a company called Altel that was bought by Verizon. 
Um, and as I was uh, kind of figuring out my life and my path, uh, from there ended up going to, uh, to Gartner. And I'll, I'll trace some of this in just a minute. But for those of you that uh, aren't familiar with some of these terms, um, Asperger's syndrome has a few different things that it's characterized by. Uh, the, this biggest one is, of course, some social awkwardness. Um, and then there's this whole idea of restricted interests. And so you'll frequently see somebody with Asperger's, they've got tunnel vision, they'll lose time in one type of activity, and they'll, they'll become subject matter experts in, like if it's a kid, they'll, they'll be the world's foremost expert on trains and schedules. Um, luckily for me, I was able to start to shift a lot of those into the security world, and that's, that served me well. And that would be one of my, my, one of my takeaways, is if you find yourself in you know, that kind of spectrum, you'll figure out how to use these things as almost a superpower and find competitive advantage in it. Now, um, there are a number of negatives that come with it in that uh, things like showing emotion, uh, talking about emotion, uh, reflecting emotion back, connecting with others, all of that's really, really hard and can affect your career and can affect your home life. I've, I've done really well leveraging and finding the right mass to put on to boost my career. If there's one area that I always struggle with because you can only wear a mask for so long, it's, it's uh, keeping being present at, at home. And so that's been a big focus for me uh, over the past few years as well. And, um, and my wife is, is my champion behind all of that as well, so she's with me 100%. Um, those of you that suspect that you might be on the spectrum and don't have a, a diagnosis, um, and you're married, if your wife is in a helping profession like a teacher or a nurse or a speech pathologist or somebody that, that pours their lives into other people to help them, it's probably likely that, that you're there because we tend to attract those types of people um, because they, they want to understand and they want to be helpful. So, so here's my journey. I uh, talked a little bit about some of the discoveries that I had, but uh, my big thing is that I started to find connections in all things. So if you were to, to meet me in college, um, I w actually all through my life I've been really interested in magic and misdirection and those kinds of things. So I was the guy in college, I had like six packs of cards with me all the time and uh, trick cards and straight cards and coins and everything else, um, only to realize it actually doesn't make you all that popular to be the guy that has all those cards. <laughs> And yeah, it might erase some social awkwardness for like five minutes while you do the best thing that you know how to do. And then, but people don't like to be assaulted with your cards. Um, and, and so I've, I've been able to grow that a little bit and weave some of that into security because when we're talking about social engineering, of course, deception and misdirection are key to those things, but I've actually elevated it. I, I went for um, specialized training in things like street hypnosis, so I actually did that here in Las Vegas. It's the perfect place to hypnotize people on the street if you want to, because people are looking for cool things to do. And so if you go out to Fremont Street, there's lots of lights, lots of sound. You say, hey, you interested in, in trying to to be hypnotized and see what's going on. Uh, first time I tried it, um, I went the whole route, name amnesia, pretended that I was invisible, had somebody uh, forget how to speak, all, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And, and, and again, you see the tie back. Uh, why do people do the things that they do? Why do they believe the things that they believe? Because that's all hypnosis is. It's the casting of a belief and then reinforcing that and building a cycle around it. Um, and so it's all framing, stuff, stuff that Chris talks about all the time. So it's, it's framing and then throwing that out and, and reinforcing it. Um, I've done training in pickpocketing. Again, you see the, the tie in there. Uh, I've done basically anything that you can think of doing. And to the, to the point where, um, like the other Chris that spoke earlier, uh, I spent a lot of time working on cold reading and mentalism, simulated mind reading, all that stuff, uh, and actually went to London and did a whole presentation as a psychic. And then I, I 
have kind of spun that and do a security-related presentation where I, I go simulate a bunch of mind reading uh, and then make it look like it's all scientific-based with, uh, um, well, some of the pseudoscience like NLP, but also eye movements, muscle movements, microexpressions, all that kind of stuff. And I ask people at the end of it, how do you think that I you know, knew this fact or knew that, that fact or knew which hand a coin was in or which side of a die was up? And then I talk about how I used uh, pseudoscience and misinformation to lead them along a garden path, and everything was just little little tricks, but everybody believes the scientific explanation because that's the one that I threw out first, and our minds like to take little shortcuts and believe the explanation that's given because it takes effort to think of something else. Same thing with social engineering. Um, and then, of course, all that works out digitally as well, and so I've spent a lot of time looking at cybersecurity, um, how we move cultures and populations, and, uh, and everything related to that. And that's moved me from uh, a really weird career path. So I've seen all those linkages, and I got to the point where I knew that if I was going to improve, because I was a, the type of coder that would unplug all the lights in the office, uh, I wouldn't speak to anyone, I would uh, lose 10 hours coding, and it felt like five minutes. People were, were pissed at me because I wouldn't interact, but I was a really, really good coder. Um, and most of you know, if you're good at something, you get promoted to your point of incompetence. And so I got promoted to, uh, to be a team leader, and I was the crappiest team leader you can imagine, um, because I didn't really care about the people that were there. Um, again, this, this whole emotional reciprocity thing was hard. It felt uncomfortable to, to interact at that level. Um, and luckily, I was working for Walmart at the time, and when you get to be a manager or a team leader, I actually got elevated to manager, even though I was a crappy team leader. Um, when I got to be a manager, they send you to Dale Carnegie training, which is a 12-week kind of immersive thing, and you have to learn how to speak in front of people and all that, and I got uh, voted the most changed uh, person by the end of that 12 weeks because I threw myself at it, knowing that I would have to, if I want to break a barrier and where my career is going to go and reap the results personally in my own life and with my family, I, I would have to do that well. And so I, I threw myself into that and that worked out well. At the same time, um, when I went to, to Altel and started to also figure out how to transition in, into uh, working at Gartner, um, there's a whole story there on how I actually accomplished that, which was building a backlog of research and publications and meeting a few people and so on. But when the time came, um, I actually put myself at a crossroads where I was having to present every week and spend probably 25 hours on the phone giving consultative advice with Gartner because I took the job at Gartner and at the same time at my, my church, uh, remember I mentioned that I had a, a degree in, in biblical studies. Um, the pastor had a failing and had to leave. And so the church was facing, uh, we're either going to have to close the doors or we're going to have to have an interim person step in until we can find somebody else. So I actually became a pastor of a church for about a year and a half. Um, so again, a guy that doesn't really know how to talk, doesn't know how to socialize, and now, now I'm in a position every week I have to create a uh, this was uh, the format of this church was 40 minute talk, uh, 40 minute talk. I had to connect with people and I literally had to walk through the wreckage of people's lives with them as they dealt with marriage problems and child problems and all the mess that, that we all face. And so that helped me kind of understand humanity a little bit, but it's only because I threw myself in. And then at Gartner, I was having to do the same thing, but at a technical level. I was having to help people peel back problems and at least simulate empathy and all those kind of things. Um, but there's a lot of interesting little cold reading techniques that, that come into that as well. And so I, I had to learn through immersion. Um, I had to also realize that a lot of talking, because I, I, with the way that my mind works, an interesting presentation has the most facts available that you can give. Um, 
the, the world doesn't like that. They, they kind of like infotainment. So I realized, all right, I need to com consolidate down to a core message of maybe three things and then just try to make it as memorable as possible. And same thing in the church world, right? You have to come down to a, uh, to a, basically a single message and reinforce that over and over and over. Because I'll tell you, my first uh, couple speaker evals at Gartner were pretty brutal. Uh, but by the time that I left, I was uh, consistently one of, the top, uh, one of the top speakers ever rated. And so over and over and over again, it was 4.5 out of 5 and above um, types of ratings that I would get. And other people were looking to me for advice on how to do this. And it's because I intentionally modeled after speakers that I liked. I figured out how to put on that mask uh, over and over and over again. What speaker do I like? What TED Talk do I like? What um, pastor do I like the way that he or she addresses the, the room? And then I learned how to, to mimic the things that would, in my mind, still feel authentic to me and project that out. And uh, like, I, like I said before, I learned kind of how to simulate uh, uh, emotion, but I also learned that people make decisions based on emotion and then back them up with logic later on. And so I had to figure out how do I infuse whatever message I'm giving with emotion? Even if I don't necessarily feel it connected to that message, I have to find a way to, to somehow bring that up and project it forward. Um, and so that took a little bit of work, and I'll talk about uh, how I accomplished that in a second, too. Um, and this, uh, this top figure is actually one from my book uh, called Trojan Horses for the Mind. It was all around uh, how, how I can use or how uh, anybody can use words and story, emotion, visuals, uh, and, and so on in order to communicate a message that actually implants. Um, and so I, I brought a lot of that type of thinking as well. How do I bring all these things together? Uh, in the way that a social engineer would, or in the way that a religious leader would, or a, um, let's say, a speaker that's trying to help you achieve personal change would, uh, in whatever context I'm in, whether that's a religious context or a security context or uh, just in life in general. So here's a couple takeaways. Um, I had to find a way to deepen connections with others. Now, I'll, I'll give a caveat here. Um, what I'm about to say may sound cold and calculating. Um, it's not meant to be. Um, but a, a guy that, uh, a writer I respect, summed it up pretty well. This is Neil Gaiman. He's the, the writer of Coraline and uh, Sandman and Good Omens and, uh, actually not Good Omens. Uh, yeah, Good Omens and uh, Neverwhere and, and others. And uh, he says, all fiction has to be as honest as you can make it because that's what people respond to. And so any time that I was trying to connect with somebody, um, I wouldn't just, you know, if they were happy uh, or sad, I wouldn't just try to emulate happiness or sadness with them. I would, like an actor, try to find a time uh, that I was happy in my own life or sad in my own life and bring that forward because I felt like it was my social responsibility to reflect that back to them in a way that was as genuine as possible. So yeah, maybe that sounds a little bit calculating, but uh, where, where my heart was at that time was that I wanted to, to give them whatever was most authentic uh, as I could. Um, and so there's this term that most people in here probably haven't heard. It's called alexithymia, um, which means that uh, whenever somebody with Asperger, actually about 10% of the people in this room have this, if, if you were to ask me directly, how do you feel about that? I get essentially writer's block. I, I can't bring it forward. It's like I'll try to describe how I feel about something and it just sticks here. That's the only feeling that I can give is it sticks here and I can't articulate it. And so that's something that really, really sucks, especially in relationships. 
And um, as, as Chris knows, there's, there's a lot of, and most of you know, there's a lot of emotions that are very universal. Um, the only problem is, is that they're, they're coarse grained. So I can, I can say I'm mad or I feel mad or I feel happy. But in human relationship, there's actually a lot of nuance that we have to bring to that. If I just, every time you ask me how I'm doing, I say I feel happy or I feel okay or something, you're, you're going to feel like there's not a genuine relationship there. Um, and, and so I, I discovered that there's actually a lot of complexity behind emotions. Um, and so now uh, I'll look at a list like this and I'll actually try to, to match what are, what are the combinations of emotions that I might be feeling and how do I bring that forward as well so that I can more accurately describe it to whoever I'm talking to. Um, and I've got lists of these resources at the end if you're somebody that struggles with that as well. Um, and then things like um, there's a concept of theory of mind which is all around being able to understand that other people aren't having the same thoughts or perspectives as you. Um, I think we suffer from this as a nation right now and we get pissed at each other all the time. Um, but that, that's, uh, maybe the nation is autistic a little bit. Um, <laughs> it definitely is diagnosable. Uh, you know, so, I mean, the first step for me was just to realize that other people had different perspectives on things. Uh, as stupid as that probably sounds, is that they're not going to see the same world as me. Um, and as I do that, it means that I have to pivot around and try to see things through their eyes as much as possible. Um, which is a, another good thing that you can do if you're a social engineer because you need to be able to emulate as much as possible the thoughts and feelings of your target so that you can figure out, all right, if, I'm, if I want to have this person do this, what would somebody maybe say to me if I were in their shoes to do that? And, and you have to be able to, to figure out how to get in their mind as much as possible, which takes a lot of effort. Um, you can also... I already mentioned this, simulate empathy by, by thinking of a time in your own life where you've had something like that happen or where you felt that, that emotion. I mean, you, you might tell me that your cat died and you're distraught over it, but, and I might not be able to get there with you because, I mean, it's, it's your cat. I'm, I'm, and actually, I'm a cat lover. I have lots of cats. But, um, <laughs> but for those of you that are not, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm... But I do feel like it's my social responsibility if you're engaging with me as a human to try to figure out how do I, how do I make it to where you're coming away from that relationship or that, that five minutes or ten minutes that we spend with each other, it, you're coming out rewarded for that in some way. Um, and I've heard other people say this when they do pen tests or when they, actually Chris says this all the time, he wants to leave people better than or situations better than they were before he got there. And I think that's an ethical duty that we have as individuals. We should leave every situation better than before. And we have to understand, of course, what better looks like, but that's, that's where we are. All right, just a couple more things to, to hit. And then, uh, you know, even if we don't express emotion deeply, we have to realize that it is there. Um, we feel really deeply. Like when somebody in, in high school said, you're like Mr. Robot and you don't express emotions. Actually, I did feel that. I just couldn't respond to it. Which is, I mean, it's weird to be trapped in your own head that way, but that's kind of where it was. So um, here, here's what I do for tactics on how to get past this. Uh, first thing is I, I started to understand concepts like reciprocity and the, the power that um, oxytocin release in the brain has. Uh, if I give something to you, you're more likely to feel invested. If Actually, even if you give something to me, you're more likely to feel invested. Uh, I got into uh, understanding uh, that I want to make people connected by, let's say if I want to build a connection in a short period of time, I actually want to meet with you multiple times in the same day in different places. That's a, that's a pretty interesting little trick, but now you have three different memories, say, in three different locations, and it feels like we've known each other longer. Um, so I'll, I'll use little tactics like that. Um, I'll look at uh, things like cold reading skills. We've already talked about that today. Um, I'll talk about uh, or, or get into studying others to find something that they generally appreciate, and something that I appreciate in them, and try to reflect that back so that I can build connection as well. 
And then lastly, uh, this whole idea of framing and understanding their worldviews and being able to, to find some point of commonality there. And, and so even though that can sound cold and calculating, here's, a, here's another Neil Gaiman quote, um, you know, what you're doing is lying, but you're using the truth to make your lies convincing and true. And you're using them as seasoning. So you're using the truth as a condiment to make otherwise unconvincing narrative absolutely credible. So yeah, I might be bringing things in in a different context, but I'm, I'm trying to weave these things together in order to bring as much credibility as possible. All right, and then uh, the last little bit here. Um, this is all about knowing yourself. So you want to know, if you, if you have restricted interests, you want to figure out how those uh, can connect together and then how you can start to leverage that in a career setting. So, so mine were psychology and magic and misdirection and everything else, and they weave together really well in a security context. Um, for you, it might be very similar, or it might be coding, branching into something else, but you do want to find different branches that you can leap from. And, and you do want to approach life and your career like an escape room. So as you learn one thing, what are maybe three avenues that that unlocks if you can combine it with all the other things that you know and are fantastic at? Because that's going to give you the pathway to continue to go. So, so I was able to um, use all of these things and finally end up as a uh, C-level person that works around the world giving presentations to large groups. Uh, I work with a guy named Kevin Mitnick as well, who some of you know. Um, I work with uh, great guys like Eric and, and others, and I, I see myself as actually uh, having done some pretty good for the community also. And so uh, I'll leave you with a few resources. I've run out of time for questions, um, but if you have questions or thoughts, I'll, I'll be happy to chat with you over there. Um, here's some articles. Uh, I do want to call your attention to Chris's book, um, and I've, I've aptly <laughs> returned the favor. <laughs> so with that, that's me. I'm done. Thank you so much.